Be Pearson, LXL, Further Maths, Cure, Corp, Your Maths Paper 1, uh, the sample paper, I think it doesn't, yeah, there's a sample paper um, for September 2017. And, uh, and let's get straight into it. So these two books here. It's actually not too difficult a paper. As soon as you see this, you think partial fractions, right? So you're just going to write it like this. You times this up here, this up here. Compare that to 1. You can either substitute r is minus 3 into here or r is minus 1 and then do it like that. Or you can just compare coefficients. So ar plus br is 0 because there are no r's over there. So a plus b is 0. And then 3a plus 1b is 1 because there's just a 1 over there. You can solve this. It's not too hard. And, uh, and we end up changing this, a is a half and b is minus a half. So we end up changing this to this, I think. And now what we can do is we can just put in numbers. If you've seen this kind of thing before, you know what's going to happen. You put in, say, the number 1, and you get 1 over 2 times 2, which is 1 over 4. And then over here, you get 1 over 2 times uh, 4. I think, actually, I took out the half first. Yeah, because I don't remember doing that. So I took out the half first. And then you put in this, you get 1 over 2 minus 1 over uh, 4. Next term will be 1 over 3. Uh, minus 1 over 5, then 1 over 4, minus 1 over 6, and so on. Uh, so this is when r is 1, this is when r is 2, this is r is 3, r is 4, and so on, all the way up to uh, these two are when r is n minus 1, n minus 1 plus 1 is just n, and then these two are when n is uh, just when r is n. Now what's going to happen here is this minus a quarter is going to cancel with that plus a quarter, this uh, minus a fifth is going to cancel with that plus a fifth, and then, of course, the minus a sixth will answer with the plus a sixth that comes after this plus fifth, because that's the first one. The pluses are the first terms, so they're just going up in ones. So a lot of stuff cancels. It's called a telescoping series. Basically, everything will cancel, except these first two adding terms, which are too low to be cancelled by anything here, because these denominators are, are big too quick. The first denominator is a, is a quarter. So these two adding terms don't have anything to cancel with. And likewise, at the other end, um, everything's going to cancel except for the last two subtracting terms. Um, of which these terms are never big enough to cancel. The biggest this can become is 1 over n plus 1. So that's the last one that cancels there. These ones will cancel with anything. So you're just left with this, 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 and this. Everything else cancels. And uh, and yeah, then we just put this together. This makes 5 sixths. We put this together. I times this one by the two algebraic things, n plus 1, n plus 3, and then times these two by the other algebraic thing and by a 6, top and bottom. There should be a 6 down there. Apologies for that typo. There should definitely be a 6 there to cancel with that 6, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about. Uh, this becomes this when you expand that out and you collect these two. So this is minus 6n, minus 6n makes minus 12n. Minus, uh, that's minus 18, minus another 12 makes minus 30. And then you deal with that and, uh, and eventually you end up with the thing that they want you to have. So good, nice, easy uh, warm-up question, I thought. Uh, second is a proof by induction. So uh, we let n equal 1, and we put 1 into a calculator, and we get this, uh, which is definitely divisible by 17. So it works for n is 1. So now we assume that f of n is divisible for any k where k is a positive integer. right? So we assume that this is divisible by 17 where k is a positive integer. And then we investigate what happens when n is equal to k plus 1. So we put in k plus 1 into this. So this becomes 3 times k plus 1, which is 3k plus 3, and then plus this 1. And then 2k plus 2 plus another 1. Simplify that. And now what you're trying to do when you do proof of induction is kind of sledgehammer the assumption step into the work that you're doing. So here we have a 3k plus 1, and this is a 3k plus 4. So let's just get rid of three of these by doing that. All right? So we say this, this indice would add up to the, with this indice to make that. So let's just separate out again, because that gives us something that's in the assumption step. And likewise, exactly the same here. But of course, 2 to the 3 is 8, and 5 squared is 25 times 3 is 75, so we end up with this. And now again, thinking about sledgehammering this assumption step in here, um, let's see if we can work out how to get this, get this to work. So 8 of these first terms would have to match with 24 of the second terms. So let's break this into 24 lots of them plus another 51 lots of them. And as soon as you do that, you realize that you're pretty much done here because this is 8 lots of the assumption which is perfect, 8 lots of the assumption, that's definitely divisible by 17 by the assumption step. And this is 3 lots of 17, which is divisible by 17 because it's got a 17 there. So this is some two things that are divisible by 17 adding, um, and so n equals k plus 1 is definitely divisible by 17 if n equals k is, and because n is 1 is true means, so if basically if there's ever a case where it's true, it's true for the next one, but it's true for one, so therefore it's true for two and true for three, and that's what induction is, perfect. You write a little sentence that kind of summarizes that and you're done. Good. This question, there are lots of ways to do this, I'm sure. It's 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 a big question, nine marks. Uh, I decided to go with, with sums of root stuff, so I said the four roots, if, I, if we call, well firstly, we've got a free root here of three minus two i, haven't we? A complex conjugate. 
So that's good. Now, if we call the other two roots um, alpha and beta, the four roots multiplied together must make 65 over 1, which is just, of course, 65. And now these two roots multiplied together, I believe, make 13. Divide by 13, and you get the two things you're looking for. Multiply to make 5. Now, the other information we have, we don't have B and A, um, which you could find, by the way, but I never bothered to. This term will be the sum of the pairs of products of roots. So in other words, alpha beta plus alpha this plus beta this plus alpha that plus beta that plus this times that is equal to 6 over 1. There's no negative because they're paired up. Um, so it's going to be one of the positive ones. So all of the different pairs you can think of multiplying of roots equals 6 over 1. Uh, lots of this we know, right? This is nice. The 2i, 2i cancel with the alpha, so we just get 6 alpha here. Likewise, we get 6 beta here. These already know we make 13. And, and, and a alpha beta we know is 5, um, so we end up with, with this here, I think. I factorized out of 6. I don't really know why. Just divide by 6 there and you get minus 2. So we're looking for two things that multiply to make 5 and add to make minus 2. You could, of course, rearrange one of these and put it back into here. Or you could think, you know, going back to sort of year 8 maths, looking for two numbers that add to make that, multiply to make that. That sounds like a quadratic. So we can just sort of jump to the quadratic we need. If you put the two things like this, I think this is the quadratic you've been needing because minus alpha z plus minus beta z makes plus 2, I think, because if you have minus this, minus this, you get plus 2. Um, so I think if we think about the quadratic that would contain these as roots, um, I think it would look like this. And of course, alpha beta or minus alpha times minus beta is just alpha beta, which is 5. So we can just solve this and that will give us alpha and beta. We don't know in which order, but we also don't care. So we solve that maybe using calculators or quadratic formula or whatever, and you get this, which is this. And so alpha and beta are this. It doesn't matter which way around. We don't really care. Um, it's just asking us to sketch these, so of course we'll just sketch them with a real imaginary axis, label them, and I think that's all we have to do. Um, of course, if you weren't so happy with this step, just do it the normal way. Rearrange this to be maybe alpha equals minus 2 minus beta, and just shove that into there, and then you get a quadratic just in beta, which will give you two possible answers, which will be these two, and then alpha is the other one. Good. Um, so let's do this question then. So it's talking about area of polar coordinates, so we know we're going to use the formula half r squared, I think somewhere half integral of r squared between the two lines um, that we're interested in. So okay, of course we've got the in initial line here. Like uh, my plan here to find this area is to do the integral of the polar thing between this initial line and a. That gives me all of this cone thing. And then just take away this triangle. So I've got a few things to do. Let's first find this coordinate a. They've given me the information to do that I think because it tells me that uh, the point A is where R is 9 over 2. So if I just shove 9 over 2 into there and solve for theta, uh, this is 4.5, so that makes a half. Cos inverse of half is pi over 3. We should all know that. Divide by 2 is pi over 6. So this is the point uh, 9 over 2, pi over 6. But more importantly, this is the line pi over 6. This, this has um, angle pi over 6 there, which means to find all of this cone area, I just need to integrate R, half of R squared between 0 and pi over 6, and that's what this is representing. But of course I'll also need to take away this triangle. Now I thought the easiest way to do that was to say, okay, well if that's 4.5, um, that's the length of this via this, and if this is pi over 6, I think I can just do some very quick trig to find this length and this length. Um, this length is going to be 4.5 cos pi over 6, which I believe is this because cos pi over 6 is root 3 over 2, and cos sine pi over 6 is a half, so this is just going to be 2.25, because it's just half of that. And now, of course, the area of this triangle is just a half times this times that. I think I went back to uh, fractions here, because it says exact at the end and, and with this and stuff. So, um, so yeah, this is 9 over 4. I know this is just a horrible piece of writing, but I really couldn't be bothered to do this properly. Um, this is, of course, 9 over 4, because that's 9 over 2, and this is just 9 over 2 half, which is 9 over 4. And, of course, we can deal with that, but, of course, we can deal with this as well. We expand these two these things out, so it's, it's a square, isn't it? So it's 4 plus 2 cos 2 theta times 4 plus cos 2 theta, which makes this, I think. Uh, and all of this, I mean, this just turns into this. All of this is integrable. Except really for this term. So we, uh, and, and basically the only double angle formula that I bother to keep in my head is this one, because I can say, well, sine squared is 1 minus cos squared. So this is cos squared minus 1 minus cos squared, which becomes 2 cos squared minus 1. So I don't actually know this one off the top of my head. I always just work it out very quickly from this one. And then if I rearrange that, I get this. And of course, if there's 2 theta here, then that means there's 4 theta here. And I think I can just shove that into there. I've also split this in half there. Um, I don't really know why but I did. I think I took out a factor of a half here. 
I did, good, because that makes this a 1, which adds to that. You double these two because you don't have a half to take out of them. So 32 plus 1 gives me 33. Double that is 16. Uh, double that is this, which is why I did it. And then I've got rid of that and put it in there. And of course, this is all very integral now. So I'll just integrate it. This ends up being quite nice because when you put in 0, of course, everything goes away because sine of 0 is 0. When you put in pi over 6, you can use a calculator. This is all actually doable with that one if you know your exact value. So that's quite nice. Um, it is doable with that one. I, I, I did it with that one just for the practice. Sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2 times 8 is 4 root 3. Sine of 4 pi over 6 is 2 pi over 3 is still root 3 over 2, which becomes root 3 over 8. So put these things together. Again, good non-calculator practice, though of course you have one, so you can just use one if you want to. Um, and then you put these last two terms together. Of course, this simplifies a little bit um, to that, I think. Yeah, it looks good. And we have our final answer, which is nice. Good. Uh, question number five. I don't really like these questions very much, but it, it's just these four marks that I don't like very much, but I'm sure with a bit of practice, I'll, I'll probably get a bit, a bit, bit better at them. So we have a thousand litres of unpolluted water. Pool is leaking, constant of 20 per day, but we're if water is flowing in at a rate of 25 that's contaminated with two grams per litre of this pollutant, which they're calling X. So the pond contains any time t where t is the number of days the pond contains this many liters of water because it's losing 20 but gaining five so that's a net gain of five per day so initial 1000 five per day gain now the pollutant goes in at 50 grams per day clearly because it's two grams per liter 25 liters entering that are polluted so pollutant goes in at 50 grams per day the important thing and the most difficult thing to think about is how much pollutant leaves per day now the pollutant um, dissolves through the entry, so the concentration of pollutant is the amount x over the total volume of water, which we've already said is this. So any time or any day t, uh, the, the concentration of pollutant is x, the number of grams of pollutant in there, divided by the total amount in there. And that's leaving at a rate of um, 20, uh, 25 litres uh, per day. Ooh, 20 litres per day, I've said. Uh, sorry, yeah leaking at 20 litres per day. So 20 litres of this contaminated water, we'll say, because it mixes instantly, is leaving per day. So therefore, dx by dt, which is the change in rate of concentration, is just what's going in minus what's going out. So 50 minus this. And of course, this uh, will simplify to this when you just divide both top and bottom by 5, uh, and you'll end up with what they, they want. And you just need to write this kind of thing out nice and clearly, because you can't obviously say out loud to the examiner the things I've just said. So write it out clearly like I like I have hopefully here, and we'll have it. Good. Uh, and now this is one of those questions where we're going to need an integrating factor. It's nice if you can just spot it rather than using the integrating factor. Like, it's nice to get to the point where you can just do that without having to bother using it. Um, but uh, we'll just use it for the practice. Um, we'll, we'll take the thing in front of the x here, which is 4 over 200 plus t, and we'll do e to the power of the integral of that. Now, the integral of that is clearly just 4 log 200 plus t. But of course, this 4 can bounce up to the top here by log laws, and then the e can cancel with the log, and we'll just get 200 plus t to the 4. So I think that needs to be our integrating factor. So that's times all three terms by that. Um, and, and we'll do that. Of course, when you times this, one of them cancels to so just leave you with three of them, and then times this as well. And now we notice the whole point of that is that it gives us something that is the um, result of a product rule differentiation. So if we look at this and we go, okay, well, if we were to just differentiate x times 200 plus t to the 4, I think we would get this because with respect to t, of course, because if you differentiate x by a product rule, that just becomes dx by dt, leave this alone. And then if you differentiate that with product rule, um, you get, uh, leave x alone, bring the four down, lower it down, and then you, and then, yeah, then you're done, right? The differential of that is just one. Um, and of course that's still equals that. And that's what the integrating factor does, right? It gives us um, a guaranteed thing that is the result of product rule. So this is the plan every time you do it. And like I was saying, it's nice if you can just spot the thing you have to use straight away. Um, but integrating factors guarantee that you do eventually get it. So that's why we do it. And, uh, and again, now we can just integrate both sides with respect to t. Uh, this integrates very easily with respect to t, of course. Um, just raise it up to a 5, divide by 5, uh, plus c. And now, of course, we can find c because when x is 0, t is 0. Or otherwise, when t is 0, the amount of pollutants is 0. So we'll shove those two values in, and we get c is this wild number, which I never bothered to work out. And, uh, and yeah, then we just say, okay, after 8 days, put t as 8 into there. And, uh, and we just uh, solve for x and we'll get some number x, which we'll use. 
um, explain how the model could be refined. You've just got to say at this point something that um, is is why it's broken. So for example, I mean, it's always this line, isn't it? Pollutant instantly dissolves throughout the entire pond. Completely ridiculous, right? If you imagine a pipe leaking into a massive pool of water, the area around where the pipe is entering it is going to be far more polluted than the other end, right? Like it doesn't instantly dissolve completely symmetrically across everything. Just a completely ridiculous assumption to make. And um, if you could find some way of modeling that, um, then it would make for a much more effective model. Good. Uh, number six then. So this is one of those questions where you, you really want to use this, right? This would, question I think would be much harder if they had just said integrate f of x dx. The fact that they've given you this makes it much easier because you can just go to your um, formula booklet and you can go, okay, well, what thing integrates to arctan? Well, this does. So I'm aiming to integrate something like this. And, and then we look at this and go, well, what's wrong with it? Well, we've got too much stuff at the top. Um, and then you can look at well, what, what integrates to that. Well, that's not in the formula booklet, but we should notice that things of the form like with an x squared plus 9 on bottom and then just linear x's on the top would, in, would uh, integrate to this because that's the, of the form f dashed over f, which of course integrates to this. Um, so, okay, put those two ideas together, and I think we realize quite quickly that the best way of doing this is literally just to split the fraction here. Because this thing is exactly of the form that I want because it will integrate to this kind of thing. And this thing um, just has a 2 there, which is wrong. But that's okay, because I can just, if I split the integral, of course, out between them, um, I can just put the 2 into the front here. And now if this 9 becomes a 3 squared, and, and we swap this order, because adding doesn't matter, um, we get exactly what we need. This I've already discussed, or integrate to that, and I think we're pretty much done here. Um, so this integrates to the right thing. I just need to shove a half in front, because of course this differentiates to 2x, not x. Just shove a half in front to make that work. And then this integrates exactly to this. It's exactly of the right form. And, uh, and I think we end up with our answer uh, fairly nicely. Um, next thing is just from very easy mean value theorem. So the formula is this, uh, 1 over b minus a integrate between b and a. We already know what the integral of fx is because we just did it. Um, so we can just literally shove in the numbers 3 and 0 into that formula. And, uh, and your calculator will do this, so you don't need to be great at doing this on your own. Um, the, the only thing you do need to do is notice that you can put together this log of 18 and log of 9 um, because we divide um, to, to uh, via the log law. Taking away logs, it's 18 minus divided by 9, which makes half log of 2. Um, and then, and then uh, yeah, this, this goes away. This is pi over 4. And then times everything by a third, and we end up with the answer that they wanted us to have, which is good. Use your answer to find the mean value over the same limit of this thing here. Now, this is just a translation upwards. Now, what the mean value does is it finds the average, essentially the average height of the function over an interval. So when you shove the function upwards by a linear amount, that average is also going to be moved up by that same amount. It's almost like when you take the, well, I mean, it is like, it is exactly the same as when you take the average of five numbers. If you raise all of those numbers by five, the mean, I should say, instead of average, of those five numbers also goes up by five, right? So if we're shoving this function up by this log of k, the mean value, which we just found out, also goes up by log of k, quite simply. Um, and so when we put, and then all that remains to do is to put these things together. Um, p doesn't have to be of, in terms of k, so this is just p here. Put these two together. Now, you can't actually do that yet. You just need to be very, um, just, do, just do something very uh, intelligent very quickly, I think, which is to say that this is the same as a sixth log of k to the power 6, because this 6 could come down to here and cancel with the sixth to make uh, just log of k. And now that we've got a sixth in front of both, we can actually now put these together as a product and say it's a sixth log of 2k to the power 6. Um, otherwise, you could have made this 2 to the power a sixth and then put them together. It's up to you. You could do either one. It's probably actually easier to do the second one, I guess. But um, in either case, this this would be this would be an answer. Oh, in fact, no, they wanted a sixth out in front here, didn't they? So that's why I did it like that. Cool. Good. Uh, question number seven is just a, a nice volume of revolution question. It's got a parametric equation. I did this, and then I looked at the Marx team and realized there was a much easier way of doing this first part. But I couldn't be bothered to change or edit any of my slides because... Um, I'm too much of a too much of a man to admit my mistakes. So okay, I just squared this to find x squared. Um, so square this. It's expanded out uh, in the normal way. Cos times cos, cos times a half of this plus another lot gives you one lot of them plus a quarter lots of this squared. Deal with this. So sine two theta is the same as two cos sine. 
Um, so the two comes out front, you get two crosses and a sign. And then I chose to deal with this and make it one minus sine squared, um, which gives me this. And then I chose to deal with this because there's still a two theta there, which isn't right. But sine squared of two theta. Now sine of two theta is two cos theta sine theta. So sine squared of two theta is just squaring that. It makes four cos squared sine squared of theta. So I think that's how I turned that into that. So play back that video and go back over my explanation if you just need to see that. I probably could have just jotted it down over here somewhere, but I chose not to. So that becomes that. Expand all this out and tidy it up. And eventually you end up with this. I also replace this cos squared with another one minus sine squared, um, just to get it all in terms of sines. And the reason I was aiming to get everything in terms of sines was because y is in terms of sine. And I was trying to write it like this. Now, at this point, I realized what would be easier to do is to start over on this side now and sort of meet in the middle. So starting over this side, y to the power 4 is just this to the power 4. Um, uh, of course, some binomial expansion gets me that very easily. Now, I've missed out the minus because I don't need it. When you raise something to the power 4, the minuses will all go away, of course. Now, y to the power 3, that won't be the case. So I will put a minus in the front because there will be a minus left over. And of course, there's two in the front as well. But this bracket here is just y cubed if you ignore the minus. And then I said, well, what's this plus this with a minus in front? Oh, I simplified that, of course. And then this plus this with a minus in front gives me all that, which simplifies to that, which is exactly the same as what x squared was simplifying to. So via a chain of logic here, I have that x squared, which is this, must be equal to a minus y to the 4 minus plus 2 y cubed um, and I have and I have what they wanted me to get apparently the go look at the marks give me point I know a much better way of doing that but that works it would get me the marks so I think that would be fine and the next bit is much easier of course you just have to integrate um, now you can actually fluke this and I and I did fluke this the first time um, of course you're integrating around this way if you imagine the y-axis to be here so you're integrating around this way, which means you're doing pi integral of x squared dy. Now, that's great, of course, because, and you could have guessed that, because x squared, they, you just got four marks for getting x squared. So, of course, now you're going to integrate with respect to x squared. Now, where do these limits come from? Well, they come from the fact that if you check out y um, via this, and you, and you range theta between 0 and 2 pi, Think about the values that y can actually take. When theta is 0, y is just minus 1, because that's 0. When theta is pi over 2, um, sine of pi of 2 is 1, so this becomes minus 2. So y goes down to minus 2. We've got a minimum of minus 2. When theta is pi, you get to minus 1 again. When it's 3 pi over 2, this is minus 1. So you get 1 plus minus 1 is 0, and minus 0 is 0, 0. And then when theta is 2 pi, you get 0, so it's just minus 1. So th y seems to range from a maximum of 0, w when you have 3 pi over 2, to minus 2 at pi over 2. So that's why I've integrated between 0 and minus 2. Now, actually, if you're just, and, and you get this hint because this whole thing is too tall, right? Originally, I integrated between 2 and 0, but just because I saw the 2 here. And that actually gets you the right answer by complete fluke. Um, and I'm not sure how many marks you get for it. Um, but you do need to realize, I, I think you probably need to realize for four marks, that y ranges between 0 up here um, and minus 2 down here. Um, and so you're integrating between minus 2 and 0 as you do your your integration. I think you would need to make that realization. Anyway, the rest of this is, of course, very, very easy. You just integrate, you, you do some limits, and you get this. Uh, and you have your answer. Good. I think we only have two questions left. A vector's question here. Firstly, let's write this in vector form by doing um, minus this, minus this, this. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Minus this, minus this, minus this to get this, uh, plus lambda lots of these ones. So that's in vector form now. This in uh, normal vector form is x, y, z dot 1 minus 2 1 equals 6 so that's quite nice as well um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the intersection between the line and the plane I can do that just by saying well x equals 2 plus 4 lambda y equals 4 minus 2 lambda um, z equals minus 6 plus lambda and now I can put those values into this dot product to say 1 times 2 plus 4 lambda minus 2 times 4 minus 2 lambda and so on equals 6 so uh, in fact you don't even need this, do you? You can just put those values straight into there. And you'll find lambda is, is 2, which means when lambda is 2, you have an intersection point of 2 plus uh, 8, which is 10. 4 minus 4 is 0, and then um, minus 8 is it? Or minus 4, minus 6, minus 2, sorry, plus 2 is minus 4. So that's our intersection point uh, of the plane and the line. Um, that's a very standard method. And, and what I decided to do here is draw this. So this is the plane. We're looking at the plane from directly above. Right, so it just looks like a 2D line. 
Uh, so looking at the plane directly above, and then we have a line that sort of goes through it somewhere like this, and that's the line L1, and we have an intersection point of 10, 0, minus 4. And that's a true intersection point where, where it goes through like this. Okay, and now when we reflect the line, if we're looking at it from above, the reflection is going to look like this. So that's this is L2, and this is the line that I'm looking for. Now, I already have, of course, a point on L2, which is the one I just found, which means if I want the vector equation of L2, all I really need to do is find another point on this line. Um, and what I decided my plan would be was, if I find another point on L1, I could reflect that point to give me another point on L2, and then I would be fine. Then I would have two points and I could just come up with a vector equation, which would be nice and easy. So, okay, let's come up with another point on L1. The easiest point is just to choose lambda zero and you get this point here. So let's just pretend that point there is there. And now how do you reflect this point in the line here? Well, what I chose to do was draw a normal line through this plane and through this point here. So here's a normal line that goes through this point here that I've just said hits the plane at a normal perpendicular angle, 90 degrees, and then goes through this line over here. Now, this is really useful and a really good idea because kind of the whole point of this form is that this is the normal direction to the plane. So the direction of this line is these three numbers here. And of course, that means that the vector equation of this line is just this point plus maybe mu of this direction vector. So that's the equation of this line here. I probably couldn't, shouldn't have called it a vector. It's probably a line, but anyway. And that's the equation of this line here, uh, just there. I, probably some copying and pasting uh, was my downfall there. But anyway, we get this here. And now I can do exactly the same thing with this line and the plane to find this coordinate. So let's write this out in terms of x, y, z. So x is this plus 1 mu. Uh, y is this minus 2 mu, z is this plus 1 mu, and let's find the intersection between this and the plane by, again, just taking this x, y, z and shoving it into the equation for the plane, exactly like we did the first time. Simplify that and you get mu is 3. So this line here, this normal line, intersects the plane um, when mu is 3, so we shove mu is 3 into here and we get 2 plus 3 times 1 is 5, um, and, and, and then 4 minus 6 is that is minus 2, minus 6 plus 3 is minus 3. So that's the coordinate there. And the reason this is super helpful is because, of course, this is a reflection. So whatever distance you went from here to here in x, you're going to do again to get to 2 to 5 to 8 as your new x coordinate. 4 to minus 2 is down 6, so down another 6 gets you to minus 8. Minus 6 to minus 3 is up 3, so up another 3 gets you to 0. And this is my, my point that I now have on L2. And now my plan is done because I have two points on L2. So all I have to say is that the line, the vector equation of L2, just pick one of the points. I picked this one, just pick one of the points, it doesn't matter which, and then find the direction vector from here to here, which is two to get from eight to 10, eight to get from minus eight to zero, minus four to get to there to there, and then choose whatever letter you want and you'll have a vector equation for L2. And I think that will be um, an acceptable answer. Excellent, good question that one. And lastly, we've got a differential equations question, of course. Um, so. It's about a fairground ride that's going up and down. It's oscillating with this motion. Maximum weight, 30,000 newtons. Uh, G is 10, apparently, because why not, I guess? Just make the Earth millions of kilos hell of the Earth. That'll be fine. Um, should have more mass is what I should have said. Whatever. Explain why the value of m is 3. Well, f equals ma. Um, you're told a is 10. So you do 30,000, which is the force, divided by 10 which gets you 3,000, and m is in terms of thousands of kilos. So 3,000 is 3 in thousands of kilos. So m is 3, I guess, is, is what we can say there. Okay, because we're assuming that the, the weight is at its max, which is cool. So m is 3. So that gives us a differential equation of 3 here, which is good, because that means I can solve the auxiliary equation, uh, which actually isn't what I'm supposed to do first. I'm so first just so, supposed to show that this is a particular solution. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at this bit here. So all we have to do is, is take this x, differentiate it once to get this, sine differentiated to cos, cos to minus sine, differentiate it again to get this, same two rules, and then shove those three results into here with m is 3 and then 4 and then just x over there. And what do you know, this uh, simplifies 200 cos t. You can do that can check it out if you want to, but it does. It simplifies to this, which means this is a particular solution because when you put it in, it, it makes this work here. And of course, it's not the general solution um, because we would also need the other bit for that. Um, is it called the complementary function? I can't remember any of the names. 
I think it is. Anyway, so we take the auxiliary equation and we solve it. So we solve this. It actually gives us two real roots if you put it in the calculator, which is cool because that means it's, a, it's the solution of the form um, a e to the first root plus b e to the second root. And then, of course, we just take this general solution, add it to the um, particular solution, and we'll have our general solution uh, there. Okay, And that's good. Usually you do that in the other way around, don't you? Usually you solve this first, get this, and then you would say, okay, a thing that I would want there is like something of the form a sine t plus b cos t and then you differentiate a couple of times to try and find the unknowns but they just gave it to you so kind of a, an interesting way of doing it but anyway so we have this as our general solution um, we can find a and b here because we know when t is zero the displacement is zero so we can shove those values in of course these become ones when you put in zero and that goes away and that doesn't so we get a plus b is 20 uh, we also know that it's released from rest. It does say somewhere in here that's released from rest. Um, I can't remember where, somewhere. Um, so that means that dx by dt is zero when t is zero. So we can find dx by dt by just differentiating all this, which isn't too hard. Um, then we can shove in dx by dt is zero um, when t is zero. So we shove those values in, we get this, which we can times everything by, I think I times everything by minus three. That shouldn't be a 3b, should it? Uh, that's a typo. That should be a singular b. And then I times everything by minus 3 to make it a plus 3b. So that should just be a regular b. Regular minus b, I guess. That's a typo there. But anyway, you get this uh, uh, with this, which you can solve for a and b. Um, by, I think I just did this one minus this one to get 2b as 100, which gives me b as 50. And then, of course, looking at this, this gives me a as minus 30. Shove those values into our general solution. And, uh, and I think we're pretty much done here because we just need to shove in t is 9 and, uh, and type it into a calculator and we get our answer to the nearest meter of 33. I think that's the last question. It is the last question. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.